Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jamie Campbell, and I am the Manager of Alumni Relations and Community Development here at Georgian College. I remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available by email and social media following today's presentation. I'd like to begin today's webinar the way we begin all events at Georgian College with a land acknowledgement. Georgian College acknowledges that all campuses are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Georgian College is dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Before I introduce Dr. Oster, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the new reality that many of us are now living. COVID-19 has affected much of our everyday lives and forced us to consider new ways of doing things, including caring for our pets, and I'm sure you will get some great information and advice from Dr. Oster today. For those of you who classify as an essential worker, I want to take this moment to acknowledge your efforts and thank you on behalf of our entire alumni family that now surpasses 82,000 worldwide. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the many alumni that donated to our recent COVID-19 fundraising appeal in support of emergency student bursaries. We were all students at one time, and I remember how challenging an, every, an, an average day could be. And of course, that was before a global camp pandemic. In short, and without exaggeration, your support has made a difference in the lives of so many students, and I know that our students, as well as our college staff and faculty, echo these sentiments. Again, thank you. I would now like to introduce Dr. Andrew Oster. Dr. Oster received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Guelph in 2003, and his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the Ontario Veterinary College in 2007 as the valedictorian of his class. He spent 13 years as a veterinarian with a total of 22 years in the field, having worked in vet clinics, referral departments, animal welfare, and lab animal medicine. He has worked at Georgian for almost three years and has had the pleasure of caring for creatures as small as baby mice to as tall as giraffes. He has two kids and finds nothing more relaxing than a warm ball of purring cat fur resting on his lap after a long work day. I encourage you all to post any questions that you may have in the chat window throughout the presentation today, and Dr. Oster will have an opportunity to answer these at the end of the presentation. And without further ado, I now hand the mic over to our guest of honor today, Dr. Oster. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, our talk today, now that we're staying at home, during uh, this quarantine period. Um, for those of you who might be working from home, um, or even if you're essential but spending some more time at home or our schedules have been turned upside down, um, we've kind of discovered what's going on with our pets um, every single day. So what we're gonna talk about today is living with our pets um, during COVID-19 and seeing if we can get a few tips or tricks for what we can do for life after. Uh, quarantine. Um, the first thing I want to do though is just put a little shout out to um, Jamie, Miranda, Kirsten, David for, for setting this up and um, allowing us to, to reach out to you guys um, and also to my department and my program, the Veterinary Technician Program, the Veterinary Assistant Program. Um, for some of you online, you may have been our student, you might be my student currently, um, and if that's the case, you could probably give this talk as well or better than, than I could, but our students do a great job and we have some of the best faculty and, and program support that, that we can ask for. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. There's, there's quite a bit for us to talk about today. Um, we really could probably talk about things for hours. Um, I've narrowed it down to, to three things and then we'll have a, a Q&A for everything that I, I didn't get to. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about is the coronavirus and our pets. Um, what's the truth that we actually know? We'll do that in a slide or less and then hopefully throw out some tips and, tr tips and tricks for you guys. Um, the first being what I hear more from any owners than anything else is they can't stand that clicking of the nails um, along their floors at home. So we'll talk about nail trimming um, since groomers opening up shortly, but um, since groomers have been closed down. And then the thing that I think will be very important is once quarantine ends, how do we make sure we keep our pets happy? 
We don't break their hearts. They don't tear your house to shreds. Um, so we'll focus um, on the pandemic first. So there's a lot of information out there and I think a lot of it can be overwhelming and can be scary. We don't know exactly from the media what to trust um, at this point, um, if we're getting good sources of information or not. Um, and this coronavirus, there are many, many coronaviruses, but this one's new to us. Um, so at the very bottom of this slide, worms and germs um, That's a great resource from a veterinary um, infectious disease expert. So if you want information on coronavirus and how it relates to animals and our pets, if you want um, information about ticks and Lyme disease or any of those other um, diseases that can be um, useful for you to know about, that's the, the website to go to. So for coronavirus, the truth of what we know is that dogs and cats have um, many different coronaviruses that, that they can have. So there is canine coronavirus, feline coronavirus. These are not the same um, as COVID-19 that we're up against right now. And these particular coronaviruses have nothing to do with people at all. So the fear that we're going to pick up um, a coronavirus from our pets is really unfounded. As it relates to COVID-19, um, or what's also known as SARS-CoV-2, there's zero evidence that we have right now that our pets are actually infecting people. So there's very, very low risk um, that the disease gets onto their fur and transmits to us. Um, cats can get infected from their owners or being around um, COVID positive people. And there is the possibility they may transmit it to other cats. There's no evidence currently that dogs will actually transmit it to other animals or between dogs themselves. What we do have a lot of evidence for is that people who are infected with COVID transmit the disease or potentially can transmit the disease to our pets. Good news for our pets is at most, they seem to get some mild respiratory symptoms and none of the animals that have been in, uh, infected with COVID um, have actually died from it. So the dog in Hong Kong who picked up COVID had other diseases that, that it ended up dying from. Um, so that's good news for our pets. And as far as talking about management, um, if you have a pet who lives with a COVID positive person, keep them in quarantine with that person. Um, don't go over to visit and walk them. It's just a vector to potentially transmit disease. If we follow physical distancing and routine hygiene, Corona is a pretty weak virus, so regular disinfection um, can kill it off pretty well. So good hand washing, very low risk of worry for our pets to spread disease, very low risk for our pets to get sick from it as well too. So a few tips and tricks for you guys to, to consider. I've included a few links below. Um, fearfreehappyhomes.com, drsophiayin.com, and Indoor Pet Initiative um, from Ohio State University. So those are three very good sources for minimizing stress in our pets and setting up a good environment at, at home for them as well too. So the thing most people seem to be concerned about is nail trimming. Certainly the pictures on this slide um, are a dramatic example, but we don't want them to get to that point. Cat's nails can curl around and cause infections and abscesses, um, and dog nails, while they rarely embed into the paw, um, they can get lame and sore. And then beyond that, um, if you look, you can, you can see there one of my colleagues, uh, her dog just wrapped around her leg right there. That's the reality for a lot of us right now. Um, but when we go away, what are, our, what are our dogs going to do about that? We don't want to end up with everything torn to shreds. So when we are consider, considering nail trimming, the first tip that I always want to drive home for you guys is take your time, make sure we reduce the stress. So for our pets, 
if they don't like to get their nails trimmed, it's not about getting them trimmed and done. It's more about getting them used to it. So number one, lots of different options for the proper tools, different types of nail trimmers, scissor based ones, plier based ones. Some people even use little um, pet grinders on them as well too. If your dog is nervous, leave the nail trimmers out all the time on the coffee table so they don't just come out when the dog is getting their nails trimmed because what's going to happen is that's going to really increase their anxiety level. Every time they see the trimmers, they associate a negative event. Every time you give your pet a treat, hold their paw so they get used to getting their feet manipulated. And every time you're giving them a treat as well too, work towards having those nail trimmers and rubbing them on the paw or the foot. Not actually trimming a nail, um, but that should make them more comfortable with the fact that they're hanging around. Um, what you also want to remember is to restrain them properly and reward the positive. End on a good note. So if you get a nail or two done and everything went good and you're worried um, your pet's going to get upset, then just stop when it's good and positive. One nail a day is perfectly fine. We don't really have anywhere else to go right now. So if you get a nail every morning at 10 a.m., you know, in a week or so, you'll have all those nails done and that will be all right. A gentle hug, especially if you have some extra hands to help you. And in these pictures, you can see that my cat is just eating some canned food out of a dish and the dog's eating from a, a Kong that is stuffed in this case with what's basically like liver whipped cream. Um, to help encourage them to be really interested in that treat and worry less about their nails, um, only give them that special treat they really, really like when you bring out those nail trimmers and when you're going to trim those nails. Um, and that's going to help them um, have the reinforcement to want to let you let you trim those nails. When we get to tip number two, um, it's the actual trimming the part of the nails. It's not very difficult. Um, don't want you guys to worry too much about it. And part of your big goal um, is just to get something done. And our goal with these nails isn't to cut them all the way back. It's just to try and trim the tip down. So when you're looking at a nail and you're trying to trim it, look at the pink. The pink is what we call the quick, and that's the vessel. So if we worry about making a nail bleed, it's because we trim that quick. Um, quicks can grow, so over time they can grow, which means if you have a really long nail, you can't cut it back really short. Um, so try and trim those nails at least monthly. There is a nerve that lies beside the quick, um, which means if we trim those nails too short, it can be a little bit painful. And try your best to just trim about a millimeter at a time um, and leave a millimeter of nail um, beyond the visible quick. So if you look at those two pictures, you can try and imagine when you have a clear nail, you can see a bit of a pink fleshy part underneath that nail. Um, the red outlines where the quick is, and then we're going to try and cut and leave just about a millimeter beyond that. Um, and that's very unlikely that you're going to hit the quick. Black nails tend to be everyone's biggest fear. Um, best thing you can do with that is take your time, trim about a millimeter at a time, and every time you trim, so if you follow that little dotted yellow line, look at the end of the nail after every trim. When you start to see a little black dot show up, that's when you know you've trimmed far enough and that's the end of the quick starting to show. So that's where you're gonna wanna, wanna stop. Um, a lot of people have really, really long nails because they only get trimmed at the groomer maybe every few months. Um, the dog doesn't like getting their nails trimmed. If you can slowly work on trimming their nails close to the quick, getting them out for walks on pavement, um, this is going to encourage those quicks to recede slowly over time and you can get back to a shorter, uh, more appropriate length nail. But be patient, trim the nails regularly. Uh, it takes a long time. It's a slow process. It will take a few months to a year to get them back. The biggest, biggest worry I think that we run into uh, when we're talking about trimming nails is 
what happens if we cut it too short? So when we're looking at those nails, um, and tip number three is just quick happens. Um, so I think we have expectations as pet owners and pet parents. We don't want to hurt our pets. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see the other slide at, at this point in time, but um, if we look at this next slide, um, I think our expectations a little dramatic. That puppy's all right. That puppy's just covered in jam. Right, it's not a big deal. It's not a murder scene if you trim a nail too short. It happens to groomers, it happens to vets, it happens to technicians all the time. The reality for us is we trim it too short and this happened to me the other day, um, trimming my own pet's nails. So trimming Penny's nails, you see some blood, you may get a few little blood spots around. You don't actually have to call 911. There are products like Quick Stop, which is a styptic powder. That's ideal. That will stop the bleeding pretty fast. If you don't have that at home, something as simple as cornstarch will work for you as well too. So again, have a treat, have something your pet's focused on. Hold the powder on the, the end of the nail for a couple minutes and then voila, life's over, no drama, nothing's worried. Um, give a few treats and then get back to it another day. That is nail trimming for us in a pinch. Um, so if you have any questions, the Q&A will, we can answer that a little bit further, um, but nail trimming is, is pretty straightforward. Take your time. Don't feel like you have to get them done um, every day. The thing that I'm most worried about um, is that right now, separation anxiety for our pets, I think is at an all time low. We work with them very closely. Our routines have changed. They're hanging out with us um, and we're not creating that separation. But once we get back to our normal schedule, um, we're going to have a whole bunch of pets who have have the expectation that we should be there with them all the time. So we're going to see them looking out those windows, hopefully not destroying our furniture or doors. And God forbid if we end up with a little bit of poop on that rug. So my goal is just to give you um, a few tips and tricks to hopefully uh, relieve that stress for you. So some animals have really dramatic separation anxiety and for them you may need medications, talk to an animal behaviorist, talk to your veterinarian. Um, but I think these are some five basic tips that really work for the vast majority of her pets, um, even if they have very, very mild separation anxiety, or at least to help us avoid developing it. So tip number one, try to maintain a normal schedule. I know that's not very easy for a lot of us. Uh, work requirements have changed. We're at home at different hours of the day, um, but try and keep your feeding routine when the pet goes out to the bathroom, um, when you have playtime, exercise time, sleeping schedules, set those expectations and set those routines. Everyone always likes to talk about how their dog knows at five o'clock they're supposed to be eating and they're already sitting by that bowl. So dogs like routine, cats like routine, and they like those expectations to be met. If we start throwing that schedule out of whack, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if we throw that schedule out of whack, there's a greater chance that we might have poop in the house, pee in the house, just accidents because they might want to go out to the washroom, um, but our schedule's all over the place. Exercise, exercise, exercise is true for all of our pets, whether it's in quarantine or not, both physical and mental. Um, every single pet I've seen with behavior issues and anxiety can benefit from more exercise. The less energy they have, the more time they're going to rest, less time to worry, less time to destroy your house. So go for walks, go for runs, um, play mental games like hide and seek, make them do tricks. So even if it's a rainy day, set aside that time to engage your pet um, and exhaust some of that stress out of them. Um, very, very important thing for you to do right now is to create a personal space for your pet. Um, so have a crate if your pet likes the crate, 
um, a closed bedroom. So just create a den or a rest area. Have a doggy bed or a blanket, a water bowl, food bowl if that's how their eating schedule goes. Um, maybe some toys. Um, use that when you are supposed to be working. So have some separation from them um, so they get used to living life without being at your feet 24 hours a day. Um, and encourage, encourage self-play. We all love playing with our pets, but try and get them to play on their own as well. Um, leave out one or two toys. I always see owners kill them with kindness, but they'll leave out 30 toys for their pets and then they wonder why they don't play with any of them because um, it's not exciting. They always have them available all the time. So give one or two toys, rotate them every few days. That will create some novelty and excitement for them. Um, and if you have things that last longer, something like a snuffle mat, which you can see that dog um, working through, you just sprinkle kibble on there and they have to find them and eat them. Um, chew toys, Kongs filled with um, peanut butter and frozen or food-based puzzles, things that take them a while, try and give those just before you leave the house. That way they'll be entertained when you're not around um, or give it to them when you're trying to work separately from them as well too. And always, always, always important, quarantine or not, um, reward positive behavior. The goal is to do that within three seconds, you know, so giving some praise, some petting or some treats. Um, that's very true for when they, you know, try and potty train them to go pee outside. You want to be outside with them. Um, but always ignore the unwanted behavior. Avoid punishment, avoid scolding. They don't understand that. Um, and that may lead it to become attention seeking behavior. You're not paying attention to them, but when they poop on the rug, you're going to come find them and interact with them for it. And dogs really work on the celebrity principle. Um, where any attention is good attention, right? We're not good at staying mad at them. So you yell at them and then you love them a second later. If they really take it to heart, it might increase their anxiety. Um, so they might be more willing to bite, not listen to what you're telling them to do. Um, or instead of pooping in the middle of the rug, now they poop behind the couch and you won't find it for a week. Um, you don't wanna run into that um, either. Um, the one thing I always encourage owners to do, say goodbye 15 minutes before you leave and then say hello 15 minutes after you arrive back home. What this does is when we leave and we say goodbye, I do it too, I'm a terrible person for it, they get very excited and then we close the door and we leave. So they have all this pent up energy and excitement and we just left them hanging. Um, when we come back home, they've been waiting all day with all that pent up energy and they're so excited to see us. Um, so if we can create that gap, say goodbye 15 minutes before and then basically ignore them, even though they're walking around our feet, um, they won't be as worked up when we go. And when we get home, um, if we go to the washroom, put our groceries away, put whatever we need to, to put away, and then finally interact with them, um, they're not going to be so excited every time that door opens. So that's going to help reduce the anxiety of leaving and then and anxiety of returning as well too. So those are my five tips um, that hopefully everyone can do. Um, certainly applies more to dogs, um, but will hopefully reduce some of the separation anxiety we might run into. And that's all I have for my talk. Um, for those of you who are still awake, um, thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A questions. Thank you, Dr. Oster. Um, so we do have some questions and, uh, and I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that I have dogs here at my house that you may hear behind me at the moment because the neighbors just came out and now they're excited. Um, so two questions actually. Uh, one uh, question that we have here is, um, so it's okay to pet other people's dogs um, and, uh, and, and it's okay for dogs to play with other dogs. Um, is that correct? Um, that, that's certainly true. I think the physical distancing guidelines um, are a good thing to thing to follow. 
probably what's more concerning as far as transmitting um, coronavirus would be collars and harnesses. So materials where um, the virus can sort of sit on. It's not easy for the virus to live on, on the fur, um, but certainly, especially if people are wearing masks, if they're wearing gloves as well too, the risk factors are very, very low. But what you want to consider is um, how close you're actually going to be to those other people, because that's going to be your greatest risk factor to consider. Great, thank you. And the, and the second question we have here is is regarding light censored nail trimmers. Um, and I guess your your thoughts about whether these are good or not. Um, the attendees worried about clipping the quick. Um, anything that makes you more comfortable trimming those nails um, and is comfortable in your hands, I say go for it. Um, there are a lot of different varieties of, of trimmers with little gadgets or, or gimmicks that can try and help you avoid trimming that quick. So if you're comfortable with it, um, I would say definitely um, go ahead and, and try and utilize it. Um, we all worry about trimming that quick. Um, no matter what nail trimmer you use, at some point in time, you'll probably hit a quick. Um, but just remember, it's not as not a, as big of a deal um, as you as you see, right? Um, so don't get too worried about it. Your pet will forgive you. Uh, the next question we have is, how do you stop a dog from being too attached? Uh, for example, he follows uh, on the attendees' heels everywhere all day long. So I think this is a great question because um, I think if you you follow some of those tips and tricks that that I was talking about, this really applies to the day to day routine um, of our pets. Um, so try to create that separate area. It's not going to be easy. They'll probably whine. They'll probably complain. Make sure that you visually aren't available to them. So if they can see you and you're looking at them, that's more than enough communication for them. So they really need a separate room or a crate that's in a separate area um, and set up that time with special treats, special food puzzles, um, special games where they can basically um, enjoy themselves without needing that praise and reward for you. Um, but dogs like to live in packs, so this is something that's very natural for them. So it's hard to create some of that separation. Um, so don't get frustrated. Take your time. Um, it's really a work in progress for life to, to get them to separate a little bit. Excellent. And now we do have uh, additional questions, but we are just about out of time. Uh, Dr. Oster has agreed to stick behind um, after the webinar to answer these additional questions. But for anybody that has to leave, um, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Dr. Oster for sharing with us today. And, and as a show of appreciation, we'd like you to know that a donation will be made to the Emergency Student Bursary Fund in his honor. Um, Wonderful. Yes, and, and remember that I'll remember alumni that, uh, that your alumni association has a wide range of corporate discounts and partnerships as well as services that are available to you. So be sure to visit georgiancollege.ca slash alumni to learn more about these. We're also excited to welcome our Georgian alumni staff and faculty to join the new and exclusive Georgian alumni network. Uh, to do this, visit georgianalumni.ca. And for anyone wishing to join us in making a donation to our emergency student bursaries, uh, please visit georgiancollege.ca slash giving um, to make a donation today. So for those of you that had to leave, thank you for joining us. And, uh, and for those of you that, uh, that wish to stick around, we'll continue our Q&A session with, uh, with Dr. Oster. So the next question we've got for you, Dr. Oster, is do you think it's OK now to go to dog parks where dogs are off leash? Um, I think I think it, dog parks are always a, a loaded question for me. Um, is it OK to go now? I think it's hard to keep um, physical distancing very well. Um, you can't control what the other pet parents or, or owners are doing. Um, so is it okay to go at this point? 
I think so, as, as long as you're comfortable following, you know, some physical distancing rules. Um, I think the challenge to always remember with dog parks is, um, and why I get worried about them is, you're often meeting dogs that you don't know. They're running around free. They might not be the best dogs you've ever met. So there's a bigger chance for potential um, dog on dog bites or dog on dog interactions. Um, and always make sure, especially if you're going to dog parks, it's a high risk for transmitting other diseases, things like kennel cough um, or parasites that are passed in the poop. These are microscopic eggs, so you won't necessarily see, see worms or anything in their stool. So dog parks, there's always a big chance of of your pet getting fleas or worms or a dog bite or negative interaction. Um, so I always encourage um, if you do go to a dog park or you go to an off leash area, um, try and make it with dogs you know who get along well with your own dog. Excellent. And the next question we've got uh, is how do you get your dog to stop biting everything when they're teething? Um, she is losing her incisors or incisors right now and, and nipping at everything. Um, teething, just like toddler kids, is, is a normal behavior. It's a little bit uncomfortable and that pressure from biting and chewing on things um, can give some, some relief. Um, so again, you could get something like a Kong, um, plug one end of it and fill it up with some low sodium chicken broth and freeze it um, in your freezer. It might be messy when it comes out, but um, something nice and cold for them to chew on. Um, the other thing is we're at an age where they're exploring a lot. Um, and for dogs, they do a lot of that with their mouth. Um, so the big thing to remember is we want to direct them to chewing um, on appropriate things. So if they are biting something they shouldn't be, maybe it's your hand they're chewing on, um, or maybe it's a shoe, have a command that's consistent, a, a sharp noise or sound like an owl that everybody in the household follows, um, which sort of shocks, shocks your little puppy um, and gets their attention. Um, so that they go away from that and then redirect them to something that's appropriate to chew on and give them lots of petting and praising when they're chewing on the appropriate thing and try and keep those chew toys um, in a specific location um, so that your puppy knows that they can go there and use things um, that are in that area to chew on so they're not searching through the house to find things. Excellent. Um, Alana would like to know, and actually I had this question as well. Um, my dog is always eating, grooming her feet. Is she trimming her own nails and is this safe for her to do? Um, it's probably not a, not a big, big deal. The question for us becomes, why are we really getting at those feet? So if it's us, if, or if it's us, if it's our pet chewing at their nails, particularly um, sometimes that can be a little stress or anxiety or boredom. See if you can redirect that to a toy or something that interact they, they'll interact with. Sometimes that could be that their nails are long and, and they are trying to trim them a little bit. Um, the thing we really want to watch for is that rest of that paw. Um, is there any sign of pain or discomfort in those nails? Um, is the paw or in between the pads of the paw getting wet? Is it getting red or inflamed? Um, pets who have allergies, um, just as, as an example, often will get itchy, irritated feet and they'll do a lot of licking um, down there. So I try and discourage it. Um, and by discouraging it, I kind of mean redirecting that behavior. So lots of exercise, give them something else to do with their mouth, make sure their paws comfortable because if it gets really moist and damp, certainly um, if it's just long nails or it's just boredom, um, that moist damp environment could cause an infection or irritation to, to come up. Excellent. And a quick comment before we move on to the next question. Um, Jackie just says, thank you, Andrew. Beatrice and Jellybean say hi. 
Hi, Jackie. <laughs> Beatrice and Jellybean are actually um, dogs who came from our program, the Vet Tech program and, and Vet Assistant program. So they're quite fantastic and, and just amazing, amazing dogs. So it's great to hear. So next question, and 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 this one is noted as a little off topic from the uh, from the webinar, uh, but the attendee would like to know: I can't get my dog to eat kibble. He only likes wet food or human food. Is there any way to entice them to eat kibble to make this change? Um, it's tricky. Wet wet food isn't bad. If your pet likes wet food and you're happy feeding it, that's a okay. Um, human food's a little different. We often end up causing begging or bad behaviors that way. Um, if it's human food and you're happy with that, just make sure, talk to your veterinarian, get a balanced recipe for them. Wet food has a lot of moisture content, um, so it, it's actually less carbohydrate rich, so they're less likely to get fat on wet food, so there's a benefit there. Kibble, I feed kibble. It's the most convenient way to feed our pets. It's the easiest way for us to feed them as well too. Um, the thing that we need to think about is um, it's boring, right? It's not terribly exciting, but if we want to get them onto kibble, number one, put the kibble out. If they don't eat it, leave it there, right? Um, don't fill them up with a bunch of other treats or other snacks to eat or else they'll have no reason to go to that kibble. Um, and sometimes what you can do is they really like the wet food, put a few kibble in there and then every couple days just start adding a little more kibble, take away a little bit of the wet food and we can usually get them to transition on. Um, if there's a problem with chewing the kibble, then maybe we might have a sore tooth or a bad tooth and that could be a preference for wet food. Um, you can also try adding water to the kibble just to soften it up a little bit, um, but make sure to get that milk checked out and, and make sure that the teeth are happy and they're able to chew the kibble comfortably. Excellent. The next question is uh, is from Shelly. So her adult daughter has a new puppy and, and they'd like um, the dog and, and Shelly's dog to get to know each other. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to do this introduction? Slow and steady is the best thing that you can do. Some dogs love each other. They get together um, and right off the bat, they're best friends. Um, other times, especially with a puppy, they're a little obnoxious and the older dog doesn't want to deal with that. Um, so slow and steady is the key. Um, what I often like to do first is rub each of the dogs with a towel to get their scent on the towel um, and then bring that towel you know, swap the towels between the houses. So they're already smelling and getting a scent um, and familiar with the smell of the puppy, familiar with the smell of the other dog um, and have it as a controlled interaction. Um, the puppy is going to be goofy and obnoxious. Um, so keep the puppy on a short leash um, and let the other dog the older dog come up and sniff the puppy. Lots of praise, lots of treats, lots of positive reinforcement. I don't want our pets to get fat, but treats are your best friend to remind them that this is a good experience. So just slow and steady. If there's any sign your other dog's ears go back, um, seems a little stressed out, then remove them from the environment because we don't want the puppy or your other dog to have uh, a bad experience if they get a little overwhelmed. So just take your time. That's the goal. Excellent. Our next question is, how do you get the fur cut out of the pads of the paws on Shih Tzus? Um, so this is this is an interesting question because um, a lot of times I'll see dogs and there'll be little mats or stuff from from the fur that gets in between those toes um, and in between those pads. What you don't want to do is use scissors. Certainly your groomer or maybe um, at the vet clinic, they might use scissors from time to time to cut things. But more often than not, I see owners come in where they've tried to cut out a little mat or cut some fur and they've accidentally nipped the skin. Um, so we really want to avoid using scissors or else you're going to get a trip to the vet um, for an unnecessary reason. Um, what you can do is get some hair trimmers. Um, so if you get some hair trimmers, you can get pet specific ones. Um, 
but oftentimes I say just get like a men's beard trimmer. You can put a little guard on it um, and then you just trim in between those toes. Um, it won't get perfectly against the skin, but it should get rid of any little mats that are in there um, and keep your pet nice and nice and comfortable, especially in between grooming with your, your regular groomer. Um, so that's what I would, I would encourage doing there. And then again, lots of treats, just like the nail trimming, have a Kong stuffed with um, some peanut butter or something for them to lick and distract them to let you get away with it. Excellent. And that looks to bring us to the end of our Q&A session. If we Fantastic. Have so any any closing comments from you, Dr. Oster, before we uh, before we say goodbye? Uh, I just really appreciate everyone coming out. I, I really appreciate the questions as, as well, too. I love our pets and, and certainly I think everyone that's here um, came because they love their pets as well, too. I don't think there's any groundbreaking information that, that I applied. These are just things that hopefully we keep in the back of our head um, to make life easier for our pets. Um, and that we don't get too overwhelmed with this quarantine and hopefully gives a few talking points um, for your friends who maybe couldn't attend this this little talk um, so that they get some some good information and and uh, they don't fall for for any of the hype or, or any of the stress that uh, we hear about every day about coronavirus. Excellent. Thank you so much and thank you to everybody that attended today's session. A reminder that we will share this through social media and email in the very near future. Take care and, and be safe.